Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Tom Kirkham, and I am a trainer with Schrader TPMS Solutions. Um, I've been with the company about 15 years, so I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, today's webinar is TPMS Unpacked. And what this webinar is um, designed to address is servicing TPMS equipped vehicles. A lot of shops, even as long as TPMS has been around, a lot of shops still don't service TPMS equipped cars. So what our idea today is, is to break that down. We're going to talk about what the TPMS systems do, what your expectations should be, what the parts and pieces of it are, and more importantly, how to service it. I will be co-presenting today with Jonathan Hedrick. Uh, uh, good to be here with everyone today. Uh, I've, I am a technical support rep. I've been with Schrader for two years, running on three now, and uh, helping customers with various uh, questions and issues. So uh, uh, it's, hopefully you get a benefit from today's webinar. Okay, so before we really get started with the um, meat of the presentation, if you have questions as we go through, we want to make this experience as interactive as we can, even though we're not face to face. Um, there is a Q&A tab up at the top of your team's toolbar. If you have a question as we go through, please write them into the Q&A uh, tab up there. And as we progress through, if you have particular things you like or don't like, or if we blow you away with new information, um, <laughs> feel free to hit the react buttons and let us know what is good and what is not. So with all that said, let's get into the um, meat of it. We're going to start off with the Schrader Advantage, and this is basically just giving you a um, perspective on who we are and where our information comes from and where we sit in the market. And for that, Mr. John here is going to lead us in. That's right. So let's look at uh, a brief overview of Schrader's heritage and our experience in the market uh, thus far. So Schrader has been around since 1844. And man, when you wrap your head around that, that's quite a while. And, and as old as this white hair makes me look, I did not start in 1844. <laughs> no. But really, as what the dates we're concerned with is 1985. That's when uh, uh, Schrader actually come out with the TPMS system. In 1994, they landed the contract for the 97 Corvette. In 2007, we introduced the first rubber snap-in valve. In 2013, we come out with the first programmable sensor. And then 15, we moved to the single skew easy sensor. Yep, dual band. Yep. And then 2018, we come out with the special uh, 90 degree sensor that you see for a lot of these different uh, aftermarket applications. So as we sit today, we are the largest OE TPMS supplier. So that means over 50% of the vehicles that come uh, new from the factory have our TPMS sensors in them. And our aftermarket sensors are replicating OE function. Some of those aftermarket sensors that we're going to talk about today uh, are the 33500, which is our most popular variant of EV sensor. We have the 33700, which is an adjustable angle uh, for superior fitment, different applications, higher speeds and pressures. And then again, that 33900, which is their specialty valve uh, uh, that gives you superior fitment in other applications uh, like aftermarket wheels. And as we walk through the presentation, we'll, we're going to address where each of these is best suited and what type of wheels and that kind of thing. That's right. But before we do that, first things first, we need to know what is TPMS and how to identify them on some vehicles. All right. So this is going to be a little bit of a review for some of us out there because a lot of the people watching are actually in the tire business or, or to some capacity. Um, but we like to give a little bit of a review on what the TPMS system is, what the expectations of it are and what the pieces and, and all that are. So we're all kind of on the same page. So what we're going to talk about today is a direct system. And that is the type of system that actually has a sensor mounted in each of the tires. And we're distinguishing that because there are other TPMS systems that do not have sensors in them, but that's um, that's called an indirect system. What we're focusing on today is a direct system. Those sensors will broadcast as you're driving. And the data that they send in will be pressure, temperature, and the sensor ID number. So as you drive along, there, they will pulse that information into the vehicle's computer. There is a receiver on the car that picks it up, and then that receiver 
gives it to the ECU of the vehicle. Now, an important note, the sensors do not make any decisions for the car. OK, the ECU of the vehicle actually is programmed with the parameters of how everything's supposed to operate. The sensors provide data. So the computer compares its programming to the data that it receives and the computer makes the determination whether you have a condition it needs to alert you to or it doesn't. So let's kind of walk through how that plays out. OK, so as you're driving along, all of the sensors are talking to the computer. They're sending in their pressure. If one of those sensors or more, and this is the first key point that a TPMS system has to do, there's two main points to a TPMS system. There's a lot of other things that fall into the option category, but at its core, the two main functions are low pressure and system malfunction. So what you'll get if one or more of the sensors send in a signal that is reflecting a value 25% away from the placard, you are gonna get a solid light on your dashboard. Okay, that is considered a telltale. So if the light comes on solid, it means that you have a pressure related issue. And just to define that, that means that one or more of the sensors is telling the computer that a value is 25% away from the target. Always gonna be below, obviously. So if you are under pressure, you will always get a solid light at 25% below. On some vehicles now, you will also get an overpressure. So that's why I kind of use the term away rather than just below, because most of the time, you know, people would say it's on a low tire pressure. Well, it's actually all of the time. If you are low, you get a solid light. But sometimes that solid light can mean high, too. I just want to make that distinction. So how do you know what the target pressure is? Well, you go to the door placard on the vehicle. When the vehicle's designed, they come up with a cold tire pressure. That pressure is mindful of the car suspension, the handling. So it plays into the optimal pressure for starting, steering, stopping, um, tire wear, suspension wear, all of that kind of stuff. But it doubles as the target pressure for the TPMS system. So in this case, 29 PSI would be the target. Now, if one or more of the sensors, just to reiterate, one or more of the sensors send in a value that is 25% away from that, high, sometimes, low, all the time, you're gonna get a solid light on your dashboard. So always equate solid light with pressure. Now, the other part of the system, the other requirement that it has is a malfunction indicator. So in the case here, one of the sensors stops broadcasting in. And if you remember, we mentioned the ID number. When you do a relearn on a vehicle, the computer registers the ID numbers for all of the sensors. So it knows how many sensors are on the vehicle. It knows what it's supposed to see. When one of them stops broadcasting in, it could be one or it could be more, but if it's not getting all of the data, that's considered a malfunction indicator light on your dash, and it is a blinking TPMS light. Now, a key to that, just to remember, that will only blink for the first 60 to 90 seconds. So real quick recap, solid light constant is always a pressure-related issue. Blinking light for the first 60 to 90 seconds, that is a system-related issue. Okay, so now that we've kind of nailed that down, let's talk about how you tell what vehicles actually have TPMS systems on there. And there are a couple ways to do this. So the vehicle type, that's the first way. Cars, trucks, and buses that are under 10,000 pounds and in the right year ranges are required to have the system. Motorcycles and heavier trucks, they can have it but it is not mandated that they have it. So that's gonna be an option thing. Some will and some won't. So we can kind of touch on the different scenarios and indicators that you get. And I mentioned the year, okay? So the Federal Tread Act is the legislation that drives the TPMS industry and what the requirements are and all that kind of stuff. That Tread Act was phased in across three years, 2005, six, and seven. So you can see that by 2007, Every vehicle sold in the United States that was in the um, under 10,000 pound category had to have the system. So the model year is one way that you can identify a TPMS equipped vehicle. Um, prior to that, 05, 06, and even going back into the 90s with some cars, it was an option. So you can have the same make, model, and year, and one vehicle have it, and one vehicle not have it. So there, in addition to the year and the type, there are a couple of other ways that we can kind of tell. The valve type is one. If it has an aluminum valve with a nut, 
that is indicating that it is a TPMS equipped vehicle. That's called a clamp in valve, and that's going to tell us it is TPMS equipped. If it has a rubber pull through type, that can be just a little bit um, more difficult to identify. So there are a couple ways. On the valve itself, you can have an exposed brass area that is beneath the cap and above the rubber coating. If you have that exposed black area, like shown here, that brass area rather, um, that's telling you that it's TPMS equipped. Also, they can put a ridge around the valve or up and down the length of the valve. So any of those three indicators that you see there, the exposed brass area or the ridge around or up and down, they're indicators that that is a TPMS equipped vehicle. Now, one exception to that, Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury did use banded sensors going back um, probably 2005-ish or so up until about 2012. Um, so they used a sensor like this here that was actually banded with like a really big hose clamp to the inside of the wheel. That's not going to have those indicators on the valve stem. And a couple footnotes to these. Um, Ford has since gone away from them. So you don't see these on any production vehicles currently. Right. Um, and because of the age, you know, a lot of them have been swapped out by now. So you don't see a lot of banded type sensors out there, but we wanted to make you aware that you can have a TPM, TPMS equipped vehicle with a standard valve stem. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be the type of vehicle that that would apply to. So the last and arguably the best way for you to tell is with the EPMS light. Okay, so that's going to be the tire with the exclamation point on it. If the vehicle is working as it should, when you turn the key and start the vehicle, the TPMS light should light, just like it's shown here in the graphic. And after just a few seconds, once it does its quote unquote bulb check, that light should go out and you should not have a TPMS light on your dash. Now, if that light stays on, and we'll just go back and quiz you a little bit, but if that light stays on and it remains on solid the whole time, that is a pressure related issue. It means one or more of the sensors is giving a value 25% away from the placard. Or if the light blinks for the first 60 to 90 seconds, that is telling us that we have a system related issue. Most of the time, that's going to be a bad sensor, but there are components on the car that it can be. And after you've gone through your troubleshooting and ruled things out, you know, you can't exclude the fact that you could have a car side issue, but primarily it's going to be a sensor related issue typically. So once you go through, you know what you've got. Um, we're going to get into servicing the TPMS system. And for that, John is going to take the lead. That's right, Tom. So the first key point that I want to touch on when servicing TPMS or servicing the valves is any all tire associations uh, suggest when you break down a tire to change the wearable components or the service packs on your valve stems because this is not something that's new. So long before TPMS, you would still, anytime you break the tire down, you would change the rubber valve. TPMS did not change anything. It just changes the way we do it a little bit. When you just, when you change the rubber valve, you were just changing the seal parts that hold the air into your tire. Exactly. And with the service kits on TPMS, it's the exact, it's a different way of doing it, but it's the exact, it's the exact same, same thing. Principle. You're still replacing the wear <laughs> items that hold the air in your tire. Right. So they're kind of important. Yep. And the importance of that is the main takeaway for that is that you want to remember the safety of your customers when you're doing this. Safety is the number one priority when you're getting a vehicle in and you're servicing their valves. You don't want a customer to uh, leave on four brand new expensive tires and you don't change the wearable components on the service kit and he wakes up to a flat tire right he's going to bring some cho uh, <laughs> some few choice words uh to that occasion and probably a bill too <laughs> yeah, right so again it's always best practice anytime you break that tire down make sure you change the service packs now there's a variety of different kinds of service packs and different valve types and and so we're going to take a brief overview and look at some of those uh, different styles that you can see. So as you can see, like the aluminum types, you have different length aluminum stems. Some of them have round ends. You can't see it pictured here yet, but there is a valve stem that's got, looks like a T that swivels. You have some service packs that don't have a valve stem at all for the aluminum ones. And then your rubber stems, you have a lot of different keyways 
Uh, so it's key that you identify those, and we'll sh we'll brief over those a little bit more as we go through. The first uh, part we're going to look at is the snap-in rubber valve and the components that make up that valve. So your first key component is your valve cap. The valve cap is the number one thing that's holding it. That's your that's primary your seal. seal. Yes, the valve cap is your primary seal for any valve, whether it be a rubber stem or aluminum. The reason for this is because caps actually have cap seals inside of them. And over time, these components, uh, any any rubber component exposed to weathering and, and heat is going to de degrade over time. So you want to make sure you use the new cap uh, in the service kit when you get them. The next component to look at is the valve core. The valve core does hold air in your tire, but again, remember, it's not the main sealing component. That is sometimes mistaken. The reason you want to change your valve core is it has a Teflon seal around that, and it may not reseal the proper way again if you retorque that in the valve. So again, make sure you use that uh, that component when you get a new service pack. Now, the, one of the most important other pieces for a snap and valve is the screw. The screw is very, very important and special for a couple of reasons. So if you get a new valve, you'll notice that the valve on the end has no threads inside. This is an OE design and it is done on purpose. The reason for that is because the screw has special cutting threads that when you run them in, they form the threads and roll them in such a way that prevents that screw from backing out during use or vibrating loose. So these are one time use only screws. So just keep that in mind. You want to use all the new components you get in a service pack uh, when you get them. Now, when a customer brings you a vehicle, you always want to make sure you look for pre-existing damage when you bring them in. This is very important to let your customer know if you see these type of things. And the customer may not bring the vehicle to you for right. these kind of conditions. Right. Most people don't inspect their valves quite to that um, that degree. So <laughs> right. they're as surprised as you are when they look at them. But these are things that you as a service technician or service provider, you want to look at because these are things the average driver probably isn't looking at. Exactly. So these are things you want to make sure that when you're servicing a tire specifically, you're looking at all these factors and you're you're giving them the most complete service that you can. And again, safety being the number safety one. Safety being the number one. Know, being the number one factor. Um, all of these types of things you're seeing on your screen can lead to valve failure. Yep. Valve failure leads to rapid deflation. Yep. And that can lead to problems. Because so. rubber rubber degrades over time. So keep yep. that in mind. light weather. And you don't, don't want to surprise. Yeah. And you don't want to surprise your customer uh, uh, with the bill afterwards after you've already done the service or started it. So again, examine those pre-existing pre conditions. Other pre-existing conditions that we have come across that are big no-nos <laughs> are some things like these. So zip ties are very useful in many ways. I'm a big fan of a zip tie, but not, not here. <laughs> yeah, not for TPMS. That zip tie is not going to hold your sensor on uh, and, and be able to handle the speed and the pressure that it's that it's going through uh, as it's rotating in tire. So again, don't don't zip tie your don't do this yeah don't don't zip tie your sensors on or duct tape them yeah. don't do that either. another very useful another very <laughs> useful tool but not here right not here so that's that is not oe spec another thing uh is the short valve stems so the main takeaway from this and why you don't want to use or i guess you should say rig some things you want to use oe spec e equipment is because Sensors and valves are balanced, and their reason they're balanced is because you don't want to have uh, wobble uh, in the rim. So if the sensor starts to wobble in the wheel because you've put a stubby stem on it, unbalanced or, product, yep, an unbalanced product, or if you've zip tied the sensor on and it's not secure, wobble can cause excess friction and wear on that uh, on that rubber valve where it's in contact with the rim, sealing uh, sealing the air in. And ultimately, what you're going to have is a damaged valve stem. So over time, that's going to add premature wear to your valves. So again, make sure you use an OE spec uh, valve stem and service pack when you service someone's quality service parts are the key. That's right. That's right. Now, some of the things to notice on rubber valves is those keyways that we showed you a little bit ago. So you can find different keyways on rubber stems. And this is why I say again, Make sure you know what the proper service kit you need 
uh, for it with, before you start your service. That way you have the proper fitment so you aren't zip tying sensors on to valve stems. So some of the different keyways you can see, like our parallel flat keyway, we have the 90 degree, the right angle uh, uh, keyway, which we call the baseball diamond, uh, or you have the TRW square keyway. Continental also has a, a parallel flat keyway. And then I'm sure a lot of you have seen the clip on style keyway as well that you see a lot in uh, Chrysler vehicles. Mm -hmm. So again, identify these proper service kits. Make sure you have access to the replacement parts prior to starting prior the, to service. the service. Exactly that. So now that we've kind of touched on some of the rubber stems and some of the different variants that you can see, let's jump to some of the aluminum types. Now, what we're looking at here first are some of the different uh, uh, sensor scenarios that you can come across with aluminum. So the first one is like the one piece fixed angle or the adjustable for the aluminum. You can see the sensor, the way it is designed, that stem is not replaceable. And that is very important that you identify that. So uh, the two piece have the advantage where you can actually replace the entire stem. And you'll notice in the different service packs for these, how, there's, how they vary and how they're different, where the adjustable one has a washer and a rubber grommet, the one piece fixed angle does not. You can see the two piece have uh, uh, valve stems that come with them. The adjustable two piece has a seat that allows that sensor to swivel. So if you want to identify all these uh, uh, items, which you need properly before you uh, service those wheels. Now, let's look at, let's break down the aluminum stem uh, key components. Again, valve cap, keep in mind, that is your main sealing component to a valve uh, because of the cap seals. You have your nut and seat. Again, this seat is important on an adjustable sensor because it has a rounded portion on, on uh, two sides of it, so it allows that sensor to adjust. So when you when you mount these, you want to make sure that you have that position. Right, you have correctly. the curvature of the seat right. ma matched with the curvature of the sensor body. Itself. Exactly, exactly. Now, the main component here to look at also is the grommet. So the grommet is, is no exception to the wear. So you can see the difference on the graphic between a used grommet and a new grommet. A used grommet is going to be crushed and weathered. It's going to be degraded. It may not properly form to that rim if you reuse it. So again, uh, reiterating that, use the new grommet uh, on a stem. It's just it's best practice. That that's, grommet is a softer rubber material. Right. And it's made that way on purpose so that it forms into the hole inside the rim, giving you the best seal it can give you. Right. When you compress it, and then you run it for X number of time in hot conditions, cold conditions, and what have you. Eventually, it loses that elasticity to it. Hardens loses up. That, yeah, <laughs> it hardens up. And when it does that, it just doesn't seal as well over time exactly. as it when it was new. And again, that's going back to the point of you do not want your customers riding around in a vehicle unsafely uh, if you put the used rubber grommet in there. And so again, then you have the valve core and uh, 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 for the valve, the aluminum valve. So let's look at pre-existing conditions involved with the aluminum stems. So aluminum stems are obviously no exception to corrosion. And you can see the examples here of different uh, varieties that you can see. But the key takeaway when you when you look at the aluminum too, you want to remember that there are that one piece fixed angle sensor. If you see pre-existing damage on that, you want to let your customer know because if you can't, for some reason, if you can't get the cap off, if it's corroded, you want to let your customer know because they're end up going to have to have a new sensor, especially if it breaks uh, during this mounting. So again, look at those pre-existing damage, identify that, let your customer know. That way, it just help. It just doesn't surprise them, and it protects you and your service. And you can see there that there's different ways that those sensors can be damaged. You have a cracked yep. nut, which yep. is most likely over torquing. Somebody's mm -hmm. not using the right tools when they're assembling it. Um, the corrosion, which tends to be more of an issue in areas where they use a lot of road salt and brine, that yep. kind of thing. Um, so these are things you always want to evaluate when you get the vehicle prior to starting a service. Exactly that. Now, another thing that you can see, this is going back to not being able to get the caps off. So what can happen to aluminum is what's called galvanic corrosion. I'm sure some of you have seen this too. Galvanic corrosion happens when two dissimilar metals make contact over time and are exposed to a lot of moisture, a lot of heat, 
basically they weld themselves together. Now, how you can get this on the outside of the valve, you know, a lot of customers uh, like to put on vanity caps, uh, uh, different style caps. Some of these caps have brass uh, threads and brass and aluminum do not mix at all. <laughs> the key point to that is you may can thread on brass right away. It will fit. It will thread on just fine. But again, over time, as it's exposed to heat, they will weld together. Again, this is going back to if you see this kind of issue, tell your customer ahead of time, and that way they are aware of what you're going to what to expect throughout your service. Now, it can happen on the outside, but it can also happen on the inside if you use an improper valve core. If you take a brass valve core and put it in aluminum, again, that can cause that galvanic corrosion. It ain't going to be a problem the day you put it in there, but it's going to be a problem exactly. when you go to service it. Exactly. Over time. Remember, that's over time. And the next guy that gets that is going to, again, make some choose a, a couple choice words <laughs> trying to get the that, guy put that core out. in there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so the remedy to that is a nickel plated valve core. A nickel plated valve core is safe to run in aluminum and brass uh, or rubber stems. So usually it's kind of just best practice. If you mainly just run the nickel plated, you don't really have to guess at it or think about it. You, you know, it's it, size fit all kind of thing in terms of galvanic corrosion exactly and a lot of shops just don't use brass cores because they can use the nickel in either exactly so brass cores you're, you're going to run into those as well just remember that they don't fit in aluminum but they will uh go brass and brass are okay to mix so you can put them in rubber stems all day long that is no no issue so now that we've went over the different types of service packs and the valve cores and all the pre-existing conditions that you can see you need to know how to select the proper service kits, and we have some really good lookup tools for that. Tom, why don't you take us through them? All right. So just like John said, now once you've gotten to this stage in the service, you're going to want to look up what the replacement parts are, and we have a couple things that can help out with that. So the first is on our website, schradertpms.com. We have a search engine on there where you can look up individual part numbers. If you have a part number that you're working with or looking for, you can plug that into the search engine. You can search it, and the website's going to tell you where that sensor or that part number that you put in, where it applies. You also can enter in the make, the model, and the year of the vehicle, and it's going to give you a couple different things. It's going to give you the different sensors that we carry that would be applied to it. That can be the OER type, the original equipment replacement, which are the pre-programmed options. It's going to give you the programmable aftermarket options as well, as well as a couple different listings for the service kits. So it's going to give you the appropriate service kit for the OE type sensor that's already in it. And it's going to give you the service kit options for the aftermarket sensors after you've actually replaced them. So that's always a good bet is using the website. Another thing that a lot of people like to use, um, not everybody likes to jump on the web all the time, is to use the paper catalog. There are a couple different um, resources there. There's a paper catalog option. There's the TIA relearn chart that has part numbers and such in it. And what a lot of people will do is buy a cabinet and they'll stock all of the different part numbers that they commonly use. They'll be able to easily monitor min-max levels for inventory purposes and that kind of thing. Um, and they keep everything on hand and just manage the inventory that they need with all the different service kits. Now, the other option, and this is a really convenient one, especially for the guys who like to use their phones a lot. We do have an app that can be downloaded for either Android, Android or for Apple. Um, and this can give you a whole lot of different information in terms of part lookups, uh, relearn procedures, um, contact information. There's just a whole bunch of information in there that you can grab on the fly while you're out in the field or with the customer. So that can be applied to, again, either Android or Apple. Um, we do also sell a couple of different TPMS assortment kits. And the choices for these kits are usually the top selling service kits and the most commonly used. Um, and they can be purchased in kits with different quantities for each one. So that's also an easy way to identify what you're using, what you need, um, and keep an, you know, an accurate count on what actually is in your possession when you start a TPMS service. This is kind of a description here for our aftermarket line. Okay, so the 33500, which is our rubber pull through programmable, it's by far the most popular. Um, that comes with a rubber valve on it, but that does have two aluminum options in silver and black. And why would you ever want to go from a rubber to an aluminum? Well, there are three main reasons. 
One is if you're going to a higher speed. Two is if you're going to a higher pressure application. Or three, you don't want to have one valve different than the other in terms of just replacing one sensor. If you have a vehicle just had one sensor go bad, you're not going to want to have, some people are not going to want to have three aluminums and one OCD. rubber valve, a little OCD on them, some <laughs> people that bothers. So again, the takeaway is you have options. Um, the 33700s are adjustable, and that one has the 20049, and as John described earlier, that is a two-piece design. So that is all of the stem pieces, including the valve stem itself. So it's all in there. And then the 33900, which is an aftermarket design that is primarily intended for aftermarket wheels where clearance and mounting space is an issue. That has a straight and a 90 degree valve in black and in silver that you can use. And where would the 90 degree be an issue? So with that 90 degree, the external part of that valve at 90, that's going to come into play when you're using aftermarket wheels, most likely with a valve hole to the inside where clearance is an issue in terms of the brake caliper itself. So again, there's a lot of different options and knowing which one you need, which best suits the circumstance you're working in is, is important. When all of that fails, you've gone through all of your bag of tricks and you're <laughs> still not getting what you need. We have our tech support line, and I'm going to brag on that a little bit. We have the best tech support line in the industry. This gentleman right here does an amazing job on our tech line. Um, that is 800-288-1804 from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. Eastern time, available Saturday from 10 to 2 Eastern time. He can help. We can help. If you call that number, you're going to get John, myself, or you're going to get Yannick. There's three of us that handle those calls, and we can help you with applications if you need to know what parts to buy sensor um, sensors themselves service kits relearn procedures pool updates pretty much anything in the tpms bubble you we can call you. and we got you um you also have an email address there schrader na at sensata.com and with that you can drop in questions if they're not urgent or you're on the fly you can drop questions into the email and we're happy to get you the information that way if that works best for you so now that we've talked a little bit about what you're looking for and how to look up the parts you need, you have the parts in your hand, and now we're going to talk about installing the sensors and mounting the tires on the rims. And John's going to walk us through that. That's right. So the first thing we need to do is tire dismounting. So when you start to dismount, you're going to remove your cap. Key takeaway from that is when you remove your cap, make sure you do the two finger twist method. Make sure you can remove it with two fingers. And then you're going to remove the valve core. Once you remove the valve core, we need to break the bead. This, you want to respect the valve positioning. You want to make sure that you keep it at 6 and 12 o'clock. And this is to ensure that you do not break that bead, uh, break that sensor as you're doing the bead breaking process. This is going to be the same scenario for the backside. Again, verify where that position is on that valve, either 6 or 12 just so you don't grab it. Most of the time on the backside of an OE wheel, you may not grab that sensor with it, but it's always just best practice. And best practices are important when doing tire mounting and dismounting, even if you're working with a, a wheel that is not uh, ha does not have a TPMS sensor. If you do this this way, you take the guesswork out of it. And, and you don't have a whoopsie yourself. when you didn't remember that this one had a sensor in it. Right, <laughs> right. So just do these, respect these safe zones, best practice with any valve, and you should be okay. So once you do the bead breaking process, throw the tire on, uh, throw the wheel onto your turntable or set it on there, whichever you prefer. <laughs> John likes to throw them around. <laughs> I, I, I get older, I prefer to just set them there. <laughs> so once you do that, put your, uh, uh, sim, uh, your, uh, a mountain just uh, dismount head on in position. The safe zone for here when dismounting is at the post center line right there. And he is starting that traction point just behind the sensor or in front, depending on which way you look at it. But what this does is protect that sensor as it comes by, uh, as that bead rolls over, the head will protect that valve. Uh, and that's the key takeaway here. Notice the safe zone is the same from the top bead to the bottom bead. So when he pulls that bottom bead up, he's going to do the same thing. He's starting a traction point right there just behind the sensor, rotates it around, that head protects it, and then uh, you should be able to fully remove uh, your tire. So once you remove the tire, we need to remove the sensor. 
So the sensor, unscrewing that sensor, uh, 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 if this is in case for a rubber snap-in, take a T10 torque tool, remove that set screw from the back, and then you should be able to just uh, slide that sensor head right off of the stem, as long as it's not zip tied on there. <laughs> uh, once you do that, uh, take your uh, valve puller, install it onto the rubber valve, use a step block, and then pull the valve through. Sometimes you may have to cut the bulb if it makes it a little easier, but you should be able to uh, pull that straight through. So let's look at a key, a couple key highlights here. So again, remove the, the va valve cap and core. But remember to respect the six and 12 positions when you bead break, and then make sure that you respect that safe zone between the dismount post center line and the back of the dismount head, and then you can remove the tire and remove the sensor. Now, let's talk about removing the clamp in aluminum. So again, you're gonna do that two finger twist method, remove that valve cap, and then take your valve core torque tool, remove your valve core from the valve. Then you're gonna take your 11 or 12 millimeter socket, depending on the application, and loosen the nut or, or fully remove it. And notice on the video, when he removes that uh, nut, the sensor, the valve stem totally disappears. And this is best practice, this is okay. Let that valve just fall right into the wheel and Sometimes if they've been there for a little while, you may they may be a little stuck. You so you should be able to just gently nudge it and fall right into the rim. Again, I'm reiterating this point, even though the valve is not there, use your best practice when you do the bead breaking at six and twelve, and when you dismount, make sure that that valve hole is at that post center line, just to keep yourself on that best practice. So let's take a quick recap of those steps. We removed our valve cap and core. We removed the valve nut and let the sensor fall inside the tire. Again, if it's stuck, you should be able to give a little nudge. Respect those positions, those safe zones at six and 12 when you break the bead. And when you place the assembly on the turntable as well, remove the tire from the rim. And the words in red are just reiterating that if you have the rubber stem, this is where you would remove your valve stem, uh, the sensor from the valve stem, and then pull it through using a valve puller. So now that we've looked at tire dismounting, we need to look at the sensor fitment and how to respect the different uh, wheel combinations that you can come across. Yep, and like we mentioned earlier, now we're gonna talk about selecting the right type of sensor for the particular application. And I mean, we, we all know that there's a whole variety of wheels out there. I mean, you've got your OE wheels and then you get into the aftermarket segment and I mean that's just huge and there's so many variations so picking the parts and knowing what options are available is important so this type of a setup right here this is a typical OE design and this is the way a sensor would be positioned and this is our 33500 sensor which is actually used quite commonly on the OE side as well that same body the Faraday body sensor and um that can be used as an OE part as well so when it is positioned in there there's three different things that you want to make sure the sensor respects. One, it cannot extend above the rim contour. The body of the sensor itself cannot be in contact with the wheel at any point. It can't be touching any of the metal of the wheel, and it has to not extend above the rim hump. So these are the three dimensions that you want to make sure you're respecting. So it kind of makes a neat little space for it right in there where it's safely mounted in, and that also is optimally positioned for um, signal communication with the vehicle. So this is a great application for the 33500, which is where it is typically applied with OE type stuff. And you have the sensor with the rubber valve, and then you have the two different aluminum options. And kind of, as we mentioned, the, when you would go to an aluminum or for aesthetics, if you want to keep everything um, together, or if you're running higher pressure or higher speed vehicles. Now let's jump a little bit into the aftermarket world. And there are so many variables in the aftermarket segment as far as positioning and angles and the space that you have available. So you can see with something like that, you don't get that sensor to set down below the rim hump or the rim contour the way we need it to. So that's not an acceptable way to mount the sensor into the tire. What you can use is a 33700. 
And that's going to give you the aluminum clamp in, but it's going to give you that adjustable body. And it's going to give you that swivel that you can get it in the safe area, that safe space in the wheel where it's not going to be impacted by the tire machine itself. So that's the 33700 as it shows there, and it shows you that it has the adjustable valve that lets you get into aftermarket applications um, and give you more flexibility in terms of respecting the dimensions. Now, the other two points, and we'll touch on this a little bit, is the high speed or the pressure applications. So with the 33700, you know, if you're, depending on the type of car, the application, the speed and the pressure could matter. When John cruises his Corolla into work, the 200 mile an hour rating probably isn't that big of a deal. No. <laughs> <laughs> Even downhill. Um, but if you're running a Z06 Vet or a Shelby Mustang, you're running something that's capable of speeds like that, then that is a factor in what you're selecting. A regular rubber valve just is not rated for that type of a speed. So that is a factor when selecting. Also for trucks, if you get into big trucks where you're running aftermarket wheel tire combinations um, and you need to run higher pressures, you know, that's another space where this sensor is going to be a better option than a rubber pull through. But even with all that said, um, you're still going to run into sensors and wheel combinations where they just don't fit right. OK, people are going to try to band them in like such. You can see that sensor is physically touching the rim, which is a no, no. Um, the standard Faraday body on the 33500 sticks up like that. That makes mounting and dismounting the tire all the more. Um, likely that you're going to damage that. It's so much easier to catch that when it's sticking up like that, even when you respect the different things that right. we're talking about. So what you've got in this type of a case, when you can't get the bend out of the 33700 and you don't have the spacing or the angling with the 335, clearly that right there, they're not acceptable mounting positions. What we can offer is the 33900. And this is primarily intended for the aftermarket wheel segment of the aftermarket industry. You have a couple different options for sensors. Again, you've got a straight and you've got an, a 90 degree angle. The 90 degree angle is really useful for really close clearance wheels when the valve is in the back um, and they are available in silver and or black. And when they get mounted up, they're going to look kind of like this here. So that's going to allow you to keep it in that safe space and it's going to allow the body of the sensor to be up and off of the rim and away from the actual contact. You don't want the plastic rubbing on the metal as you're spinning the tire. That's a recipe for early failure. <laughs> so what this sensor will look like when it is mounted in the tire is like that there. It's going to sit in that space where it is in its uh, most protected position. And another little footnote to this particular sensor, if you see that little arrow that's on there, that little arrow always wants to be pace, facing to the outside of the wheel. So it wants to be aimed out. And the reason for that is for um, the sensor when it broadcasts a signal, that is the best orientation for the vehicle to re be able to receive that signal, okay? So you wanna remember that when you mount them up with that arrow, you face that to the outside face of the wheel. So now you've got your sensors selected, you know which is the best type for what you're doing. And now we wanna mount that tire back up and John is going to walk us through tire mounting. That's right. So when tire mounting, you use a few select tools to do this, to assemble your new new service kits. And I just want to briefly touch on some of those different tools that you will use uh, just to give you an idea of, of their specs and things. So the first tool is for the rubber snap and valve where you have the T10 torque tool. I'm sure a lot of people have used that where you are installing that set screw onto the rubber stem. This tool is pre-torqued to the 11 and a half inch pounds that's required for that screw. You have the valve core torque tool, which is pretty self-explanatory. It torques the valve core into the stem. This, uh, the spec for that would be three and a half inch pounds. Then you have the universal uh, nut torque tool that comes with uh, the 11 and 12 millimeter sockets, just like I said, depending on your application. And this tool is adjustable in inch pounds. So if you get different OE applications that you're working with, not just aftermarket, verify the OE specs uh, of that, nor that nut torque spec. That way you're not just cranking them on down in there. Our website is a good <laughs> Our resource for that. The app will tell you information like that. And yeah. a lot of times on the box for the sensor itself, yep. it will tell you as well. Exactly. So verify, again, verify that the correct uh, torque spec for the application. Or else you could end up with the nut that was in that sh that a demo crack. with the crack nut. Yep. You have the aluminum and it's not meant to be cranked on there with a 
you know, a half inch drive. Overstressed it. <laughs> half inch drive wrench. <laughs> right. The other key little tool here, it may not look like much, but it's the grommet removal tool. So it, it makes easy removal of the grommet on the uh, aluminum valve stem. Uh, makes it easier to do that or installing the rubber grommet. It ensures that you're able to push that rubber grommet all the way on and nice and straight so you do not damage it. And then we have the T20 torque tool, which is the special tool for our 33900 that Tom just went over uh, showing you for different applications. So now that we've kind of briefed over the tooling, let's start uh, tire mounting. So first thing we do, we need to install our rubber stem. In this case, you're going to put it on that valve puller. This is important so you're not holding that valve and sensor with your hand, ending up twisting the sensor on that keyway. It's just easier if you put it on the valve puller. And then install your sensor onto the keyway. Take the T10 torque tool and run it down until the tool clicks. When that tool clicks, that lets you know you are at that proper torque spec of 11 and a half inch pounds. Once you do this, apply a little lube around the valve, uh, the valve stem, and then put it into the valve hole on the rim, and then install the valve puller. And you want to use your step block when you pull the valve through. This ensures that you're going to pull that valve straight without damaging the uh, the rubber or rip it. Rub, you run the risk of ripping the. You want to bring that sensor. valve parallel to the valve hole. So you want to bring right. that straight through. Yep. If you bring that valve through on an angle, um, you just increase the odds that you, you could can tear damage. the rubber or damage the valve when you do it. Right, right. So again, make sure that you do that. And when you do, verify that that sensor is respecting all of the, the contours that Tom went over earlier. So let's do a quick recap of, of the steps that we just took. So we, we threaded on our valve puller, uh, our valve stem onto the valve puller. We assembled the new sensor onto the valve uh, with a T10 torque tool and then applied tire lube to the valve, run it through the rim hole, installed our valve puller again. And remember, pull it through using that step block to make sure that it pulls through uh, straight. And again, make sure that you uh, respect those contours, make sure the sensor is not protruding past that rim contour, not in contact with the rim or protruding over the rim hub. So now let's look at installing the aluminum. So the aluminum uh, stem is going to be a little different. So you're going to slide that through the sensor and then you would slide that seat. Again, remember that seat has two round portions on it that allow that sensor to, to swivel. So make sure you respect that when you install those using your uh, grommet removal tool install that uh, that rubber grommet on there nice and straight. And, and you can see how fast that went. Right. Um, that's a common thing that we'll hear for shops that don't actually, that, that are choosing not to do this, is that it takes extra time. But I, I, when you do a couple of these, you man, they faster. go quick. You get, you get faster, faster and faster, faster to the point <laughs> where you can do all four of them in a minute. Right. You know, it just doesn't take that long. And it's not, it's, it's well worth the extra time investment to be putting a safe vehicle back out on the road. Exactly, exactly that. Now, once you do that, install the sensor into the rim, apply that nut, and again, you want to make sure you verify the proper torque spec. I know our aftermarket sensors happen to be 71 inch pounds off the top of my head, but again, verify that spec so you don't go cranking that, that nut on there just to anything, and that way it functions the way it is designed to. So let's take a quick recap of those steps. So we assembled our new clamp on valve onto the sensor, pushed our seat and the rubber grommet on. We used 11 or 12 millimeter uh, to tighten the nut after we slid it through the rim. And then again, check for that proper uh, proper fitment onto the rim once you uh, tighten that nut down. So now that we've done that and we've assembled either or to our rim, we need to assemble the tire. We need to put the tire on the rim. So once you slide your tire onto the rim, you need to respect the safe zone in here. The safe zone is opposite of, uh, of the dismount head, 180 degrees away from it, uh, as you can see in the video, when he starts. And it's very important when you start this, I will show you right here in this video, a couple things I want you to see. So you can see how the rim, uh, the valve is right here. It's, he started 180 degrees away from your mountain dismount head. There's a traction point right here just behind the sensor. This is very important. As that valve rotates around, the mount dismount head protects that valve uh, as it comes around so the tire does not break it. The same 
positioning needs to be done for the top bead as the bottom bead, and you can see that same traction point. Once you've done that, you should have your tire successfully on your rim, and now we need to seat the bead. So make sure that you put your tire assembly uh, and wheel assembly into a tire cage, remove the valve core, and then you want to inflate the tire until the bead seats, and then you can reinstall your valve core and, and inflate your tire to the placard pressure. Again, depending on the vehicle and the application, check the door for that, and then you can install the valve cap, and that wheel assembly should be ready to go. So let's look at a quick recap of those steps just to reiterate. Uh, make sure you apply tire soap to both beads. Uh, I forgot to mention that when we went through. Apply tire soap to both beads before you start. Push the tire's lower bead onto the rim uh, and rotate that sensor around to the uh, safe zone, which is again 180 degrees away from the mount dismount head. And then uh, start your traction point just behind it. Again, it's the same for top and bottom beads. And then you are able to uh, uh, inflate uh, the tire to the correct pressure once you seat the beads. Put your valve core back in, tighten it, uh, torque it down, and then install your valve cap. And then you are ready to send your customer on their way. You are or ready to rock and roll. Cruising down the road. <laughs>
but we'll see if we have any questions in the Q&A. I don't have any Q&A uh, questions so far. Joke, all right. That means I guess we explained it so well that nobody has a question. <laughs> Experts. <laughs> Yeah, make sure you feel free to ask anything. OK, I have one. Why are the clamp in valve a one time use only? The clamp in valves are one time use only for two main reasons, actually. One is most of those kits, the nuts that come with those kits have a crush ring in them. So when they go in, they tighten up and you break that crush ring and then you get the proper torque on it using your torque wrench. Um, that is basically set up that way to make sure you don't over torque them because they are aluminum. It's aluminum thread on the nut as well as on the stem itself. You can't over tighten those. If you do, you can easily damage the nut or the threads, which is why I highly would recommend using the correct installation torque tool so that you get that proper torque, that proper pressure. Um, but th those are the primary reasons. One is that there is a crush ring that is one time use. Once you install it, that crush ring breaks and it's not recommended to reuse them. Yeah. All right, thank you for that. Um, I will just reiterate to the participants, if they do have any questions to ask, to use the Q&A button at the top of the Teams banner. The uh, other question that I have here is, uh, can you mix banded sensor and valve mounted sensors? Yes, you can. So valve mounted sensor is just the mounting, uh, the way the sensors are mounted in the wheel. So the band sensors or uh, valve mounted sensors broadcast the same type of data. Uh, they're just mounted into the wheel differently, but they can coexist per se. If you had a customer that wanted to replace one and left the other three banded, that's totally fine. But uh, again, remember that the band sensors are slowly fading away as they didn't run them very, very long. And they are, if they're the original band sensors that have been on a car, you know, at this point, presumably for 10 to 15 years, there, um, you know, you would. Our recommendation would be that if one fails, yeah, the other ones are likely not far behind. Yeah, so I would um, I would recommend replacing. You know, you're in that window <laughs> of the life expectancy, so I would say you know you want to recommend at that point to change them over. Yeah, but the car doesn't know if the sensor is band mounted, no, no or it, if it's a valve mount. It does not care. No idea. It just <laughs> wanted to receive the right information, yep. and the Easy Sensor or our, our OERs mm -hmm. either are going to broadcast the right data to the car, so the car is not going to know the, the car does not care. Yeah, good question though. We get that a lot. Yeah, actually, that's a good tech call question. All right, thank you, gentlemen. I have another one that came in. Um, Interesting one. Why is the Teflon on some valve cores red and others are black? So somebody was paying close attention. To the <laughs> yeah. um, That's a good question. In terms of TPMS, the black Teflon band and the red, the difference is primarily temperature. So the red banded Teflon seal is rated for a higher temperature. Um, that one is rated up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the black Teflon seal is rated at 225 degrees Celsius. So in practical application, what you would see, primarily service kits that are rubber stems and are brass inserts, the black. they are gonna have the black. Yeah. And then the aluminum service kits or the aluminum sensors as a whole assembly, if that's how you bought it, they will typically have the red. Yep. But the 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 spec difference in them is the temperature. The reds are rated for a higher temperature than the black salt. But great question on that one. All right, and I will uh, encourage again participants if they have any questions to use the Q and A button on the top of the Teams banner. I do have some participants that have raised their hands, but unfortunately I cannot 
unmute their microphone. So you really need to use a Q&A uh, form. All right. Uh, um, I have another one here. That might be the last one. Uh, how can a Ford, how can a Ford vehicle and GM vehicle operate on the same frequency but not be compatible? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So there are a lot of make uh, and even some model vehicles that use the same frequency, but that's not the only piece of data that the vehicle uses when it communicates with sensors. So sensors also have app codes that they use to communicate with vehicles. And the app code between a Ford and a Chevy per se would be different, even if they run on say like 315. Right. So that makes them not interchangeable. A good kind of way to think about that is a radio station. You know, you can have a radio station that broadcasts at a frequency, right? Yep. 90, 90, 96.3. You can have that frequency, but it can play different songs. And that's kind of what this is. It can broadcast the same frequency at the same frequency, but what it broadcasts at that frequency can vary can from manufacturer yep. to even car to car. Yep. Um, so that's why you can have the same frequency, but what they're saying is different. All right. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. That was the last one I had in the um, Q and A. Right, right at time, also. So yeah, we're, we're thank, good. Thanks everybody for for your time and attendance. Yep, we appreciate everybody uh, tuning in and listening, and hope you found some of that to be um, educational and you know a That's little special. bit more about TPMS now than you did when we started. Yep. <laughs> all right. You all have a wonderful day.